Jesus, that's what we ask for this morning, that your presence be in this place, that the Spirit just fills us, God. Lord, we thank you for this morning and this time that we get to worship you. Be reminded of who you are and your goodness. I pray over this time where we're entering into time, just listening to your word and learning, learning what it means to follow you, live life the Jesus way. Lord, we love you. We pray over this time and we thank you that we get to gather like this. And in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Y'all can take your seats. How's it going? High five, friends. Really excited to be back with you guys for another day with Louis Giglio and his book, The Wonder of Creation. You guys want to say hi? Hi. Today is called Behind the Scenes. Your fathers can see what is done in secret and he will reward you. Matthew 6, 4. There's no goofing off if you're an ant. Every single ant in a colony has a job to do, even if you can't see it. There's the queen who lays eggs. There's the drones who stay with the queen. And finally, there are the workers. They're the smallest ants, but they do the most work, which explains their name. The worker ants take care of the eggs, pupil, larvae, all sorts of baby ants. They also take out the trash, find food, and defend the nest against invaders. Some workers stay so busy they never leave the nest. They may not be the biggest or strongest, but without their behind the scenes work, the colony wouldn't survive. That reminds me of Obadiah in 1 Kings 18. If you haven't heard of Obadiah, that's totally okay. Lots of people haven't. He lived in the Old Testament times and worked behind the scenes to save a bunch of God's prophets from an evil queen. So you might not know his name, but God definitely does. Doing important things for God means more than just the stuff everybody sees, like preaching, leading prayers, being a missionary to a faraway land, that kind of stuff. Those are all great, but so are all the behind the scenes things, like sending a card to a faraway missionary, teaching a younger kid about a Bible song, or Bible story, or saying a little prayer for someone who's having a rough day. It doesn't matter whether or not the whole world knows because God sees every little thing you do, even the behind the scenes. Here's our prayer. Lord, help me to remember that every single thing I do is for you. And it's important whether anybody sees it or not. Amen. Now our share the wonder part. You can do important things for God. Think of at least one kind and helpful thing that you can do secretly for someone every day this week. Slip a Bible verse in your mom's purse or tape it to the fridge. Make a snack for your brother or sister. Say a prayer for a hurting friend. Be a behind the scenes worker for God today. Thanks so much for hanging out with us. High five friends. We look forward to seeing you next time. You are dismissed to class. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Good morning, guys. Welcome to Grace Welfare Chapel. If I haven't had a chance to say hello yet, or if I haven't seen you before or in a while, my name's Ryan. I'm one of the pastors on the team here at Grace, and my family and I just got back from vacation a little, a little bit ago, so if I haven't had a chance to say hello, that's why. Um, good times with the family, but I was just telling somebody before service, like, they said, Is, are you feeling rejuvenated, rested, restored? I said, mmm. You know, when you go on a trip with the kids, it's just that. It's a family trip, right? Uh, not a vacation, but a trip. There was lots of great memories, lots of wonderful times that we spent together. I don't know that I would go with restful. Uh, I, don't, I don't think that's the word that I would have used to characterize that time. But I'm really excited to be back with you guys, excited to be able to get into this new series that we're starting today as, as we kind of look forward to the fall. And I know that feels sort of counterintuitive, right? Fall. We're like at the end of summer, don't wish to fall on us too fast. But here's the reality, guys. School is fast approaching, 
Um, that, that's our, the rear view is like the vacations and all that kind of stuff. School's fast approaching. Football has started. The Ravens played last night. We are in fall, guys. Believe it or not, fall is upon us. And I'm really excited about what God's doing here at Grace and where he's kind of directing us and moving us. And I think that's going to start with this series that we're starting today. We're calling it Chase the Lion. And I think that's going to have a all sort of context in and of itself that we'll start developing as we get into Scripture today. But it's, it's one of those things that, man, there's a lot of new stuff happening in this fall season, right? I was talking to some people this week. We got kids going back to school. We got people starting new jobs. There's just something that's, yes, bittersweet, but something about this fall season that's just like a time to start new things, and so there's something exciting about all of that. But if we're honest, there's something that feels a little heavy about it too. I was talking to my son Micah this past week. He's starting middle school this week. And it just feels weird to say that out loud. My son is starting middle school. And I'm feeling a little overwhelmed at everything that's getting ready for him. But it was interesting, the conversation that I had with him, it went something like this. Micah, how are you feeling about middle school? And he goes, Dad, it's, it's just school. It's just school. I said, well, what about like the homework? He's like, dad, we have flex now. I'll just do it in flex. All of these things that felt like big, heavy, overwhelming things, new school, new teachers, more students, more homework, all of these things that I would have said, man, these are huge obstacles. He's like, nope, this is the same stuff we've been doing. This is no big deal. These are just new opportunities. And I love that sort of approach that he took as he kind of was flipping the script away from the way that I was thinking about it and flipping it on to a much more like excited, opportunistic sort of approach that he was taking towards elementary or towards middle school. It feels like it should still be elementary school. And so as we get into this series, I love that idea because really that's the kind of the heartbeat of this series that we're starting into. It's us flipping the, the script away from fear and towards faith. It's, it's choosing to lean into hard situations as opposed to running away from them. And so I'm excited about this series that we're launching here today. You see, because over the course of this series, we're going to spend a lot of different times in a lot of different chapters, but there's going to be one section of Scripture that's going to kind of act as the, the I don't know, the thing that's going to hold it all together. And that scripture is going to be in, in 2 Samuel 23. And, and a lot of these ideas, this, this, the scriptures, the ideas that we're going to be talking about in the midst of the series, they were first introduced to me during my first year in ministry. Back in 2007, I was just kind of starting in as student ministries pastor, and somebody handed me a book by a guy named Mark Batterson. And it was called In a Pit with a Lion on a Snowy Day. And it's quite a, quite a title, and you'll get it once we get into Scripture here this morning. But at the time, the Scriptures that they looked through, the ideas that were being communicated, they were game-changing sort of principles for me. Because every bit of my being felt like I was out of my depth, that I wasn't sure that I had what it took to get through or to make the decisions that were being required of me at that time. And so every time I think of those things, I come back to this book. And it's kind of a timely reminder to me because this book kind of was pointed out to me on my bookshelf a couple months ago. And I was like, oh, yes. As I've stepped into this lead role here at Grace, a lot of those same feelings that I was having back in 20, or 2007 have started to come back up. Oh, this feels heavy. Oh, this feels overwhelming. Oh, do I have what it takes? And over and over again, get reminded from Scripture and these principles, man, how good God has been and how faithful he has been in the process. And so as we introduce some of these big ideas, I'm hopeful that at least by the end of the day today, Chase the Lion won't seem so outlandish. That title won't be like, oh my goodness, I have no clue what we're talking about. There are no lions in Carroll County, Maryland, Ryan. It will we'll all start to make sense and we'll collectively have the opportunity to be encouraged by God's faithfulness. And then be energized for the adventure that, that is still in store for us. Things that he, I believe God is calling us to even this fall. And so rather than spending any more time talking about it, we want to just kind of hop right into Scripture. But I want to begin by praying. So would you pray with me? Jesus, Lord, we just want to say thank you for today. 
God, thank you for getting us right here, right now, to be able to encounter this scripture together in this place. There's something beautiful about your, your body, your church, gathering together and being able to spend some time in scripture. So, Lord, we pray that you would teach us, that you would give us the words, that we would not just be good listeners and being able to hear it, but then we would put our hands and our feet to action as we hear these truths and these principles. God, thank you for the good things that you're doing. You are good and you are doing good. And we look forward to the things that you have in store. So we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Like I said before, the scripture that we'll be hopping into this morning is 2 Samuel 23. And in 2 Samuel 23, just to kind of give you an idea of what we're hopping into here, um, my guess is this is probably not a section of scripture that any one of us has spent any length of time in. This is not like the one that you go to and you're like, hey man, this has got a good story. And you're like, that's my go-to story for this thing every time that comes up. This is like one of those things that you probably, maybe if you did a Bible in a year thing, you would have come across it at one point in time if you've done the version apps. But this is probably not the section that your favorite memory verse is coming out of. This is probably not a section where there's too many stories that you're like, yeah, I've heard that one before. Maybe there are, but I'm guessing probably not many of them. You see, in, in this chapter here, we're going to be focusing specifically on the second chapter of the verse, but to get it started, you've got King David. And King David, he he had been set up as the king very early on in his life, but he didn't become king until much later. And so he had a bunch of guys that spent a whole lot of time around him in the midst of that journey from just a shepherd boy all the way up to the king of Israel. And in scripture, they're referred to as David's mighty men. Isn't that a cool kind of phrase to have, have somebody refer to you as? I think it is. And so these David's mighty men, they get put in all sorts of unenviable situations. All kind of situations that you're left going, man, I don't want any part of that. And so as we hop in here today, I want you to help me out with something. I want you to just kind of keep a mental tally of how many of these situations these guys find themselves in that you're like, nope, I want nothing to do with that. I don't want to be there. I don't want to be around there. I don't want to be anything with that. Okay, so start keeping a running total with me as we hop in here. This is 2 Samuel 23, and we'll start in verse 8. And I'm just going to do a disclaimer up front. There are a lot of names in here, and I will screw them up. So just just so that we're all on the same page, we're going to be extending grace to Ryan as he says these names. And you're going to understand it here in a minute. All right, here we go. This is verse 8. These are the names of David's mighty warriors. Josheb Bathshebeth, a Tachmanite, was the chief of the three. He raised his spear against 800 men, whom he killed in one encounter. Next to him was Eleazar, son of Dotai the Athelite. As one of the three mighty warriors, he was with David when they taunted the Philistines gathered at Pass Damon for battle. Then the Israelites retreated. Okay, can we just pause there for a minute just to gather the depth of the situation that we are encountering here? David and his buddy Eleazar, they are taunting the Philistine army. Two guys taunting an army, just so we're on the same page here. They think they've got an entire army at their back supporting them in this process. That whole army dips. They're out. They retreat, and David and Eleazar are left there going, Hey, guys, that's what's happening right here, okay? So David and Eleazar, they go and taunt the Philistines, and then the whole army behind them retreats. No worries, though, because Eleazar stood his ground and struck down the Philistines till his hand grew so tired it froze to the sword. I don't know the last time you've had something like that happen. There was a a moment when we were traveling out west where I was kind of driving along the edge of a mountain and I felt like my hands were so gripping the steering wheel because I was afraid we were going to fall thousands of feet, what felt like thousands of feet down to the ground. Maybe it was when you were weed whacking around the house and your your hands get so vibrated that when you can't get, you can't even open your hands when it's all done. I don't know the last time your hand felt so frozen to something that it couldn't move, but my guess is it wasn't when you were in hand-to-hand mortal combat with just you and your buddy against an entire army. The troops returned to Eleazar, so the, the army came back. When? Just to strip the dead. They came back after it was all said and done. Next to him, next to Eleazar, was Shema, son of Agi, the Ararite. 
When the Philistines band together at a, pl- at a place where there was a field full of lentils, Israel's troops fled from them. It seems like a recurring theme, doesn't it? But Shema stood his, or took his stand in the middle of the field. He defended it and struck down the Philistines, or struck the Philistines down, and the Lord brought about a great victory. During harvest time, three of the 30 chief warriors came down to David in the cave of Adullam while the band of Philistines was encamped in the valley of Rephem. At the time, David was in the stronghold, and the Philistine garrison was at Bethlehem. So just, are we understanding this? In the, in the cave in Adullam, that's where David is and all of his buddies. And in Bethlehem, the place where the Israelites should be, um, is the Philistine army. Their, their garrison is around that. And so David, he's, he's dreaming, he's nostalgic, and he's longing for water. And he says this, Oh, that someone would get me a drink from the well near the gate of Bethlehem. He's parched. He's living in a cave. But he laments this thing as he's kind of dreaming nostalgic about this water, this very specific water that would come from the pool or the well near Bethlehem. I'm not sure his tone there, but here's what happens next. Verse 16. So the three mighty warriors broke through the Philistine lines, drew water from the well and near the the gate of Bethlehem and carried it back to David. I'm sorry, what? David, he just asked for water. He's just kind of, you know, waxing reminiscent about this water. And these guys go and break through the enemy lines, dip him out some water and bring it back to him. And then That's wow enough, but then watch what he does. Get this, he refuses to drink it. After all of that, instead he pours it out before the Lord. Far be it from me, Lord, to do this, he said. Is it not the blood of men who went at the risk of their lives? These encounters over and over again, they have you going, wow. I'm sorry, what? You have to read it twice just to make sure you understood it. Abishai, the brother of Joab, son of Zeruai, was the chief of the three. He raised his spear against 300 men whom he killed. And, he, and, he, and, so, also, or, and so he became as famous as the three. And then finally we get to the guy that we're going to be kind of keying in on for this series. This is verse 20. Check him out. His name is Benaniah. Benaniah, son of Jehoiada, a valiant fighter from Kabzeel performed great exploits. He struck down Moab's two mightiest warriors. He went down into a pit on a snowy day and killed a lion. And he struck down a huge Egyptian. Although the Egyptian had a spear in his hand, Benaniah went against him with a club. He snatched the spear from the Egyptian's hand and killed him with his own spear. Such were the exploits of Benaniah, son of Jehoiada. And if you follow it all the way to the end, there's a little verse at the end, verse 23, and it says this, and David put him in charge of his bodyguard. Did you catch that little short, maybe sort of throwaway sentence in the midst of all that, verse 20? He also went down into a pit on a snowy day and killed a lion. It's as if, you know, killing two of Moab's mightiest warriors and, and taking out a, an Egyptian warrior who is probably a giant, um, even though he had a spear and I only had a club, as if those things weren't enough for, like, resume building, he did this. He chased a lion into a pit and killed it. And I don't think it's an overstatement to say this, but this is probably one of the most dumbfounding sections of Scripture, one of the most inspirational even sections of Scripture, sentences in Scripture. My guess is we've all had encounters with lions, but probably at a zoo, right? We've gotten up to the zoo, we've looked at the lion, we've seen him through the wall there, and he's probably just chilling out in the corner, sleeping in the corner, and we're like, oh, that's, that's a nice lion. Maybe we've seen him on Nat Geo or, or Discovery Channel, and we've seen him more in their element. But, but as we're, we're thinking of this, this is a completely different scenario. My guess is it's probably pretty safe to assume none of us have ever come face to face with a lion staring us eye to eye. And one of us is making it out of the pit and the other one is not. That is not a scenario that any of us have probably found ourselves in. By any sort of measure, finding yourself face to face with a lion in a pit on a snowy day, that's a bad day, Right? 
That's a really bad day. Snow's fallen. It's a bad day. In fact, it's probably the worst day imaginable. Actually, probably you could take it a step beyond that. That's probably your last day. That's what happens when you get stuck in a pit with a lion on a snowy day. That's probably your last day. And one of the things I love about this chapter, as, we, as we're looking at it here in 2 Samuel, is that it records nearly an entire chapter full of situations just like this. One guy taking on 800 guys. Bad day. Two guys taunting the enemy only to have all of their guys that had their back run away. Bad day. Getting double teamed by two of the best warriors that Moab has to offer. That's a bad day, guys. By my count here, there's at least eight sort of situations that I don't want any part of recorded in that section. I don't know where you landed on, where your count was at, but I count about eight of them that I don't want to be in. They're just not situations for me. But here's the interesting connection between all of these situations because I think it, it reveals something beautiful about the heart of God. God is in the business of placing us in the right place at the right time. God's in the business of placing us in the right place at the right time. This book right here is full of stories and stories and stories of how God got people from where they were to where he wanted them to be. But there is one huge, big, overarching catch to all of that. Often the right place feels like the wrong place, and the right time feels like the wrong time. Maybe you saw this in our first read-through of chapter 3, but two of these really bad situations, they end with a repeated phrase. What was it? And the Lord brought about a great victory. Guys, nobody signs up to, to go out in front of the army and, and taunt them and have everybody that you thought had your back run away. Nobody signs up for that. No military commander says, you know what? You know how we're going to approach this? The best strategic approach here is we'll send two guys out, and they'll make a fool of the enemy army, and then the rest of us will run, and that's how we're going to win this battle. There's no, no military commander out there that's going to say, that's a good idea. No, that's wrong place, wrong time, bad day. But God says, you know what? I can work with that. I can handle that. Here comes mighty victory. I'm quite certain that when Benaniah started his day, he didn't say, you know what I really would love to happen today while I'm out on my walk? I would love that it would start snowing because I think the snow is beautiful and that's an amazing thing. And then you know what else I hope? I hope the ground gives way underneath my feet and I fall into a pit. And when I get down there, I realize there is a man-eating lion at the bottom. No, Benaniah did not start his day dreaming of all that. That's just simply wrong place, wrong time, bad day. Pits with scary creatures, they do not end the way that you want to. Every movie that's ever been made is a testimony to that. But God is saying, you know what? You know what makes a really great resume builder for the, the king's bodyguard? I went down into a pit on a snowy day and I killed a lion. In fact, that one gets you bumped to the top of all the resumes that are out there. You can't not interview the guy who had in a pit with a lion on a snowy day, I killed, I killed him. I went down in there, I chased him in there, and I killed him. You can't not interview that guy. And so here's the deal, guys. God is in the character building business. He has a unique knack of using our past experiences to prepare us for future opportunities. But just like with most of these situations, many of the God-given opportunities that we're presented with in life, they come looking like 500-pound lions staring us down while we're in a pit on a snowy day. That's the way that they feel. And so in those moments, we can choose to respond out of fear and run, or we can choose to follow God into these moments that he's already set up in advance for us ahead of time and lean into them. Do me a favor. Think back over your life a little bit. I'll, I'll kind of rehearse a few of these moments in my heart and I, in my life, and I think you're going to kind of grab a hold of these as well. Some of the greatest opportunities I've ever had were the scariest lions I could possibly have imagined. Spending the summer after my junior year in Ethiopia and choosing to go there when I knew that was the only time I would be able to spend with my now wife, Jess, 
that felt really risky. That felt like there was a chance maybe that wasn't going to work out the way that I had intended. But you know what happened there in Ethiopia? God started to pull my heart towards ministry. I felt I started to feel that call towards ministry. That's where he began cultivating my heart in that regard. Asking Jess to marry me. Man, I've played all, sport, all sorts of sports. I've been in all sorts of clutch situations where I've needed to come through for my team. I felt that anxiety and those, those butterflies in my stomach, but nothing will compare to that moment where I got down on my knee and I said, Jess, would you be my wife? Like it felt like a huge, awful risk at the time. But there was something beautiful about that. And little did she know, she, when she said yes to that, the terms were about to get all sorts of shifted up. She didn't marry a pastor. She married a salesman. That's what I was doing. And then a little while after that, everything changed. And that was another one of the big risks I wrote down. Man, not long after we were married, Jess is in PA school. And I felt called to go back to ministry. And so I, I, I quit my job. I quit my job. We are two students, no income. We got rent. We got expenses. Two kids, no income, lots of expenses, and we're both in school. And for six months, we didn't have a job. But God provided every step of the way. And it felt really risky at the time, but he was working things out. And I even think about this past year. We, we have a newborn son. If you guys have been around a little while, you know some of our family history. We've got an, an 11-year-old. We've got a 10-year-old. Oh, my goodness. I'm going to screw this up in front of everyone. Almost 10-year-old. Yes. 11-year-old, um, almost 10-year-old. And we have a baby boy, Levi. Last July, he was born, and man, was that like a risk. That felt like a 500-pound lion staring down at us. What are we doing? Are we able to do this? Do we have what it takes to go back into that newborn phase of life? It felt overwhelming. Even stepping into this new role here at church, man, it takes me back to 2007 when I first started into ministry. I feel out of my depth at times. I feel like the waters are deep, but, but over and over again, I see God show up. And God kind of do his thing. Lots of thoughts that we had pop in. Lots of valid thoughts that felt like things were risky. But the reality is, is in all of that, maybe, maybe if we had had our druthers at different points in time, we would have rather played it safe. And we would have rather done things a little bit differently. But man, God knew what he was doing in all of it. The whole way through and in some of these, part of me probably would have rather played it safe. But God has been teaching me some stuff through scriptures like these and through this last one that we'll walk through here in, in a moment. But one of the big ideas is this. There is no risk in taking a risk with God. There is no risk in taking a risk with God. It might feel like this big and overwhelming. We might not think, I, I don't know what to do with a newborn. It's been 10 years. I'm not sure I can get back into that. It's not a risk when God's calling you to it. It just isn't. And so if you've been around here at any, for any length of time, you've probably heard me say one of my core convictions, and it's this, that living life the Jesus way, it leads to abundant life. When we do things the way that J Jesus said to do them, when we operate and move through life that way, it leads to the most fulfilling kind of life that we could possibly imagine. That's sort of my paraphrase, so to speak, of John 10.10. And Jesus says, you know, the thief, the enemy, he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that you would have life and you'd have it to the full. There's something about Jesus' approach even to the lions that he faced in his day, the opportunities that he encountered that we can learn from as we, learn, as we kind of work to pursue this Jesus way of living. And we see one of those encounters here in Luke 22. Jesus, he's just gotten done finishing, having this really special moment with his disciples. They've had this, this dinner, this last supper together. And in that moment, he's kind of, he's given them communion. He's, he's kind of pointed to the bread and to the cup. And he said, these things, they're not just simply bread and wine like we've been used to doing every Passover since then. Now this actually, this bread is going to represent my body broken for you. And this, this cup, it's going to re represent my blood poured out for you for forgiveness of sin. These are new sort of takes on all of this. And as these disciples are hearing it, these apprentices of Jesus who have been with this guy now for three years, they're starting to start to realize the foreshadowing that he's talking about. And they're starting to catch up on all of these hints that he's dropping along the way. In some cases, not so much hints, but just saying what's about to happen. And they're starting to get a little, little concerned. 
And so once they get to the end of that, they're obviously sad. But Jesus, he's in the habit of doing this thing over and over and over again. And that habit is he goes and he gets away and he connects with the Father in prayer. And he brings three of his, his closest disciples with him. And as they're, as they're doing that, they get out to, to the Mount of Olives and they pause. They pause and they pray. And then Jesus says, hey, man, guys, stay right here. Pray, pray that you don't fall into temptation. And I'm going to go a little bit further out and I'm going to pray. And going a little bit further, he falls down and he begins to pray. And this is Luke 22, starting in verse 41. He, Jesus, withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down and prayed. Father, if you're willing, take this cup from me. I don't know that there's too many more real prayers recorded in Scripture. Like, that is just so core level. This is what I'm feeling right now, Father. I'm I'm realizing all of it. I can see the end, the beginning, and I know all of the details in between, and this is hard stuff. This is hard stuff. If there's any other way than me walking through this situation, God, please do it. But he changes things up. I mean, have you ever been there? Have you ever been in that spot where you're like, man, I can kind of see the writing on the wall. I see how this is going to play out. I see the way the circumstances are coming together. And you're like, dear Jesus, if there is any other way, please let me do it that way. I know I've prayed this prayer. I think back to, to times that were, Jess and I were walking through infertility for three years before Micah made his arrival. We have a miscarriage, and I'd be like, I just can't walk through this again, God. I can't handle my wife being devastated like this again. If there's any other way to do this, God, please do it. My plate feels so overwhelmed and so full, and I'm just left going, ah! Like you just want to scream. God, if there's any other way to do this, please do it that way. I've definitely prayed the prayer. I'm guessing you guys probably have a time or two as well. But guys, the second part of this prayer, it makes all the difference. Because lion chasers, they just don't throw in the towel when circumstances get tough. They know that God is in the business of placing them at the right place at the right time, even when it feels like the wrong place at the wrong time. Lion chasers, they pray the second half of this prayer emphatically. Yet, not my will, but yours be done. That's the second half of the prayer. Not my will, not what I want, not how I would kind of make things and all the circumstances play out based off the way that I'm seeing all of this. He says, not my will, but yours be done. You see, Jesus, he's able to see through the annals of time. He sees your face and he sees mine. And he knows, Father, you are good and you are doing good even in the midst of this situation. So everything that you have in mind, God, Father, do that. Do everything that you have in mind. Jesus knew when he stepped down out of the throne room of heaven and put on flesh and bone, he knew everything that was going to mean. He knew the mocking. He knew the sham trial. He knew the crucifixion. He knew the death. He understood all of that. And who knows, to us on the outside, maybe we say that's a big risk. But Jesus, he understood this principle. There is no risk with God. It's not a risk when I'm stepping out in faith, doing the thing that God has called me to. And knowing that, he leaned into the Father's plan, took on flesh and bone, and he did that all. He did the thing that we couldn't do. He lived life the way that God actually designed it to be lived, perfectly perfectly. It was because of that sinless life, his sacrificial death, that now there's an opportunity for us to be brought back into that relationship that was designed at the very beginning, right relationship with God. Guys, we aren't perfect. That's probably not news to anyone here. If it is, then let me just break that to you. We're not perfect. Guys, we, we screw up. We choose our way over God's way over and over and over again. But, and it's because of that that we have this broken relationship with God. 
That sin death, that justly has earned us death apart from God. But God isn't content with anyone dying a death that is completely apart from him. That's not a thing that he's content with. He doesn't want anyone to experience that reality. This prayer right here in Luke 22, this is the defining moment that changed everything for us. Everything. Jesus leaned in. He knew he was positioned by God in the right place at the right time, and he chased that lion just like Benaniah did. Situation after situation throughout Scripture is a testimony that even, even like people that we don't, have never heard of, like Obadiah, like we just talked about in the High Five video, you might not have ever heard him, but God knew he had him in the right place at the right time to accomplish exactly what he had in mind. Situation after situation, the resounding testimony of Scripture is that even though his people may not have known how it was going to work out, even though he didn't know the the ways that it was all going to work out, God made a way. It didn't matter how big the lion was, was that was in front of them. It could have been like, you know, Moses coming up to the Red Sea with the Egyptian army bearing down behind them. And they're like, well, shoot, how are we supposed to get across this? And God says, don't worry, I got this figured out. Wind comes in and poof. The sea just parts, and they're just able to walk right across it. From Eden in the beginning up through Jesus and the cross and all the way up to when Jesus returns and all the messiness that we experience in this world is made right all for once and for all time. You know, in all of that, God has been in the business of placing his people in the right place at the right time. And so the question that we're left to wrestle with is, what is that lion? What is your lion that you find yourself locked eye to eye with right now? What's that thing that you're like, man, this feels so overwhelming and so heavy. I'm not sure how I'm going to deal with this. Is it a new job? A new role at work? Students, you're going back to school. Maybe it's ELA or chemistry class. New teachers or teachers that are going back. Man, you're like, I'm good with all of these classes. This one right here, that's my lion. That one's going to be tough. I know that's going to be hard. I'm not sure how I'm going to handle that. What is that going to look like? I don't imagine too many of us have given any brain space to what an actual lion encounter in 2022 Westminster, Maryland would look like. That's not something we've ever thought about. We don't have lions around here. We don't give any brain thought to that. But in a figurative sense, this is probably the most fundamental sort of thing that we could be thinking about. We've all encountered these kind of figurative lines. We've all fallen into pits. We've all, maybe some of it due to our own decision-making, some of it our own bad habits. Maybe we found a cloud that's been sitting over us like a snow squall that just is making the future feel dim right now. And we're just not sure what the, the way forward is in all of that. Our hope for this series is that it would kind of prove to be sort of a survival guide. As we look through Scripture, we'll find truths from Scripture that we can be kind of applying, that we would be the very best lion chasers we could be. That we'd be willing to run headlong after this life that Jesus has called us to, this abundant life that he offers, knowing that when we're taking a risk, it's no risk with God. There are no risks with him. Not running away from the lines that cross our path, but purposefully chasing them, taking full advantage of these opportunities that God created in advance for us to take advantage of. He has so graciously set the table for us, and he's saying, all right, the table is set. Now walk in it. I've done all the work. You just need to walk. You just need to go. And so that's the the table has been set. Everything has been prepared. And so collectively, we're going to encourage one another through Scripture as we aim to chase lions and develop these lion-chasing skills, things like defying odds. Man, I imagine when Eleazar was standing there in front of that army bearing down, he wasn't even one, two, three, four, five. There's a lot of them. There's not a lot of us. The odds, they're very poor right now. That wasn't it. He knew, man, God is with me. I know David's got my back, and we're just going to go. And what did God do? He had a great victory that day, defying odds, facing fears, reframing problems, embracing uncertainty, taking risks, seizing opportunities, and a willingness to look foolish. That's what lion chasers do. That's what they're about because they know there are no risks 
with the Father. As we wade into all of these things that feel overwhelming and feel heavy, we know there are no risks when we step out with God. And so I'm so excited for this series, excited for where we're going, and excited that we, we might become the Benaniahs of our day, that we would follow fearlessly God into the things that he's calling us to. Would you pray with me? Jesus, Lord, thank you for today. God, I thank you for your encouragements from Scripture. God, I thank you for, for stories. God, I thank you for people that have come before us that have waded through hard things, that have done this tough stuff. God, that they've been willing to, to have that, their stories told for eternity's sake. And I thank you for Benaniah. God, I don't know how he got into a pit. I don't know how it was snowing. I don't know how he got there with the lion. But God, I'm grateful for that story that it was, it was in there so that it could be a source of encouragement to us. So God, as we face these things that feel heavy and overwhelming, things that we would much rather just throw our hands up and say, I can't do it. God, that we would realize that leaning into those sort of situations, that's just another Monday for you. That we don't need to be worried, but there are no risks in taking risks with you. So God, thank you for the things that you're doing. Thank you for the things that you're teaching us. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and worship together.
down my heart through all of my failure and pride. On the hill you created, the light of the world abandoned in darkness to die. And as you speak.
love the, the chorus of that song. Uh, it says, I'm going to sing in the middle of the storm. It's, it relates so well to everything we just heard that despite those things that we're facing, those lines ahead of us, that we can sing because there is no challenge too great for you. I pray that we take that with us as we leave, that that's just our encouragement as we head out from here. God, we love you. We praise you this morning. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Go ahead and grab a seat. Uh, just kind of while, while we're doing that, I want to just kind of keep mulling over that. There's nothing too heavy, too hard for what God is capable of. Um, he's got it all figured out. The end, the beginning, all the in-betweens. We're going to kind of move into a, a time now where we get the opportunity to respond gratefully back to God for all of those amazing things that he does for us. You know, if, if you call Grace Fellowship Chapel your home, if this is the spot that you've chosen to invest in, to, to be a part of, we'd love to be able to invite you into a time of tithe and offering. Have the opportunity to respond back to God, the generosity that he's shown to us in the gospel, in the way he's cared for us, his faithfulness to us. This is our opportunity to respond. And we can do that. There's a basket on the way out. If you'd like to leave cash or check in there, you can do it on the website, www.gfcwestminster.com backslash give, or you can do it through the app. You can find that on just about every app store that's out there. And it's a great opportunity to get plugged into the mission and vision of Grace Fellowship Chapel. If this is one of your first few times here, hear it from me. There's no obligation in that. We love that you're here. In fact, that's probably the most important thing I want you to walk away from today hearing. We are so glad that you're here. There's an opportunity, if you even have your phone with you, you can scan the QR code on the seat back in front of you, and that'll take you to the Connect page of our website. You can get to know a little bit about us, the community that we're developing here at Grace, and, and it gives us the opportunity to learn a little bit about you by filling out a, a brief little form. And we'd love to, to start that dialogue, to get to know you a little bit better and how you can fit into the community that we're developing here at Grace. I regularly say we are better because of you, and I know that would be the case. So I just want to invite you to be able to respond in that sort of way. This is one of your first few times here. Um, I want to make sure that I have a special time to say thank you to all the people that were participating in the service projects that we did last week. If you didn't know about it, we had a special day last week where we connected into a lot of different things happening around, around the, the city. Um, and, and we got a bunch of pictures that you can, you'll be able to see here in a minute. But all sorts of opportunities, places where we were serving at the local elementary school right around the corner. We were serving at the community garden, um, getting that set up for the fall and, and helping to weed and get that all situated. We had a team that was working at one of the local homes doing meal prep for a local family that, that's walking through cancer diagnosis right now and all the treatments associated with that. We even had a crew of people working on a bunch of creative stuff, doing cards that we can use to bless people over this next little bit. Lots of opportunities that, that we had to be able to pour into our community. Our vision here at Grace Fellowship Chapel is that, that the world at large would know that we are for this house. We're about the people here, investing in the people that are here and seeing God do his very best work in the people that are here. We're for the city. And we want the world to know that. And we're also for the world seeing God made famous in all of those arenas. And so just some really exciting things that were able to be accomplished just this past week as we were looking into all of that. Community garden right there. I think that's, is that most of them, John? It locked up. Well, joys of computers, right? Well, one of the things that I want to make sure as you look at wonderful pictures of the community garden, we'll talk and turn, turn the page and talk about some baptisms. We've got a baptism celebration today, and we are so excited for it. 2 p.m. today at the Wilson's home, we are going to be able to celebrate God doing a new work in the lives of some of the folks that have called this place home. And I am so excited to be able to celebrate with them. If, if you've been on the fence about it, if you've been like, you know what, I know the next step is to get baptized, and I know that's a thing that I, I should be thinking about, and you're still on the fence about it, no, there's still time. I'd love to have a conversation with you even today and to be able to celebrate with you at 2 o'clock this afternoon at the Wilson's home as we celebrate that. And so if you think that's you, if God's kind of pricking your heart about that, come and have a conversation with me afterwards. Last thing that I want to talk about before I bring some friends up here is I, I want to be able to just kind of 
put it out there again. We've talked about this before. Project Midbar, it's our, our wilderness ministry trip that we take before, the, it's a through hike for the Appalachian Trail in Maryland from starting in, this year it'll start in PA and go all the way down to West Virginia. There's something that's interesting that happens as you roll through the book of Luke in the beginning part. You see how God uses his time getting away from everything into the wilderness and listening to how God speaks. We believe there's something special about doing life the Jesus way, and we aim to replicate that during that time. So October 5th through the 9th is an opportunity for us to be able to get away, to pause, to listen, to see what God would say to us during that time. We'd love to have that team kind of finalized here by the first week in September. Uh, So there's time to get all the information out and all of the kind of details, and so you can begin preparing for that. Uh, so if you're interested in that, please come and talk to me. I'd love to, love to have you be a part of that team. Now, I would love to be able to introduce and, and invite up one of our student ministry guys. Come on up here, Sam. And Sam's going to tell us a little bit about uh, some upcoming student ministry stuff. Well, hi. Like Ryan said, uh, my name is Sam, if I haven't had the chance to meet you. Uh, I'm one of the people who runs student ministries. Uh, if you've got youngins, hopefully in middle school, because that's my jam, I would love to hang out with them. Uh, we have, uh, coming up, we'll have a weekly one. We're still getting rid of a little bit of our summer activities. Uh, we've got an ice cream party coming up. We've got one more big student kickoff bash. Uh, and then we're going to head straight into our weekly meetings that we have with the middle school. So if you've got kids that are going into middle school this year, I would love, love, love to spend time with them. Uh, there will be an opportunity where you can come up and chat with me afterwards. We've got a group chat I can put you into, or if you just want to hear a little bit of information about it, I would love to, to share are some of the ways that God's been working in our younger kids. Uh, If you've got high schoolers or kids that are going into high school, we will have information about that as well. We're still ironing out a few of the details. Uh, But regardless, if you've got kids, we've got a place for them. High five middle school or high school, we would love to pour into them. Uh, We will have a little bit of a better opportunity to talk afterwards. So I'm actually going to invite Dan up to talk a little bit about what we've got uh, going on after the service. Thanks, Sam. Yeah, so after the service, we got a couple things going on. First off, uh, we said this is going to be our small group open house Sunday. We talked about that a couple weeks ago, kind of highlighting the different life groups kicking off this fall. So after the service, you you should have gotten a paper that looks kind of like this that's got a list of the life groups on it. If you didn't, I think there's more out of the table out in the foyer there. But we'll be around the sides of the building here. So we'll have anyone that's in the Monday and Tuesday groups will be on this side. The Sunday, Wednesday, and Friday groups will be over on this side. So if you want to come talk to any of us about the group, get a little bit more details, you can. Um, We've included the middle school club with Sam there too. So if you have someone going to middle school, you want to catch Sam, she'll be over there as well. But want to make sure everyone gets a chance to talk to anyone they want to if they have a desire to do that. Um, Also, uh, we have prayer partners. We talked about that a couple weeks ago. They pray over the building beforehand. They also come up front here at the end to pray as well. So at the end, when we finish the service, if you want prayer for something, maybe you've got a lie and you're chasing that you want prayer for, the prayer partners will be underneath these two screens here so you can come get prayer from them. Uh, But before we dismiss with prayer, I have one last announcement that I'm very excited to make. Um, As most of you know, Grace for many years has been a two-pastor church. And we've been operating as a one pastor church for a while and that's put an awful lot on ryan's plate so the elders we realized early around this year that this needed to change we needed to bring in a second pastor so we started the process and the the bylaws give us a very specific way we have to go through it so we've been following through that process it started in april putting together a job description for a full-time discipleship pastor Um, and then we advertised that internally to the congregation once the job description was finalized for a period of four weeks as was required to see if we had any internal candidates come forward. After four weeks, we had no internal candidates come forward, so we did two things. First off, we realized during that time that to be good stewards of the money given to us, our desire for a full-time position had to be scaled back to a part-time or volunteer position at first. And then we advertised into the community at large too, with the hope that the part-time position will become a full-time position. Uh, With advertising that in the greater community, we got one applicant. Um, We formed a search committee. The search committee talked to that applicant and felt like that applicant was good enough we didn't need to get any more resumes in. They referred him to the elders and the elders got a chance to meet um, with him and we were also very thrilled with him as well. Um, His name is Steve and he has been here before. Um, Let me see. 
Okay, so Steve is not a stranger to GFC. He actually is uh, Laurie Ridgely's brother, and he's even preached here back in 2016. Um, Steve's been in ministry for over 30 years. He spent about 25 years on the pastoral staff of Grace Community Church in Kingsville, Maryland. And over the last five years, he served as a missionary overseas in Asia. And God has brought him back to the area now. And so as, as he applied it for this position, we got a chance to talk to him. We were all really thrilled with what we heard. And so now we have a chance to present him to the congregation. There's a specific wording I need to read here for you in, in accordance with the bylaws. And it says this. In accordance with the bylaws of Grace Fellowship Chapel, the Board of Elders is calling a special congregational meeting to be held on September 11th, 2022, immediately following the Sunday morning gathering at 20 Bell Road in Westminster. This meeting will be held to review the recommendations of the committee, the results of the elders' interviews, and to hold a congregational vote to approve Steve Bickle for the role of discipleship pastor at Grace Fellowship Chapel. Before the congregational meeting, we, we encourage you guys to get a chance to know Steve and his wife, Amy. They're here this week. They'll be here other weeks as well. I'd actually like to invite Steve up front here as we get ready to close in prayer so you can get a chance to see him. Um, after prayer time, like I said, small groups are going to be around the side, prayer partners under the screen. Steve's going to be up front here. So if you want to get a chance to introduce yourself to Steve, ask him any questions, I'm sure he'd be thrilled to tell you about his experience in ministry and the different things he's gotten a chance to do. So let me close us in prayer, and I want to pray over Steve, too, and pray over the congregation as we get ready to head out here. God, I thank you for Steve. I thank you for, for leading him to us, God. I thank you for the, the impression he made on the search committee. I thank you for the impression he made on the elders. And uh, now we just pray, God, that you would give wisdom to the congregation, God, as, as we now bring him forward to the congregation and ask for their approval for him to come on board as pastor. We just ask that you give them the same wisdom that you have imparted to us so far that they would be able to see what your leading is so that when we get together, vote God, it would be very clear what your will is for our church. We thank you for Steve's willingness to come forward and all he's done in ministry so far. God, we also just thank you for, for Ryan's message today and for the, the realization that so many of us in our lives are chasing lions even right now. And we ask for your wisdom as we navigate those times and your courage and strength for us as we go into areas that might be scary in order to serve you. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. And you're dismissed.